Okay, uh, it's 6.01 and we've got a lot to get through, so I might get us started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar on private land conservation in Victoria. My name is Jamila Hallinan and I'm the Head of Legal Education at the Environmental Defenders Office or EDO. And co-hosting with me tonight is Elise Broadfoot Mills, who's our education solicitor. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land in Sydney, and I'd like to pay my respects to Gadigal elders past and present, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight, and also extend those respects to the land, um, to the elders from the lands that you're coming um, from tonight. So the purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to private land conservation. And landholders in Victoria have a number of options to choose from if they're interested in private conservation. And we're lucky enough to be joined tonight by some of the providers of those options. So from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, we have Dr. Andrew Warnock. Um, from Humane Society International, we have Helen Church. From Trust for Nature, we have Ben Williams. And we're also going to hear from Peter Mulheron um, of Land Conservation Victoria. I'd really like to thank our panelists for making the time to speak with us tonight. This webinar is part of our Defending the Unburnt collaboration with WWF. And we've got Stuart Blanche from WWF um, with us as well tonight. He's going to start us off by telling us why it's important to protect land that escaped the black, black summer bushfires. I should also note up front that not all the options we'll be discussing tonight will be available in areas impacted by the bushfires, but they are all capable of contributing meaningfully to conservation of land and biodiversity. So Elise is driving and can you move on to the next slide, please, Elise? Just a disclaimer up front that um, the information we're providing tonight is just that, it's information, it's not legal advice. If you do need further assistance from the Environmental Defenders Office, you can apply for free initial legal advice through our website and we may be able to assist depending on our capacity. Next slide, Elise. So first up tonight, Stu's going to tell us why WWF and EDO are working together to defend unburnt areas. Then I'm going to briefly outline what private land conservation is, and then we're going to look at the various options that are available to Victorian landholders. There'll be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask questions of our panelists. You can do this by um, using the Q&A function and you can put your question in at any time. Our panelists might choose to answer your question um, as we go in the chat. Otherwise, Elise will read out your question at the end. So I'll hand over to Stu now. Great, thanks, thanks Jim. Uh, uh, glad to be part of the webinar. Hi to all the other panelists and everyone listening online. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from a Wabakal country in Newcastle, and I manage WF's Towards 2 Billion Trees program. And I'm the key contact at WF with the Environmental Defenders Office for the Defending the Unburnt Partnership. That partnership um, sprang out of the terrible bushfires. I know we've been through two and a half years of pretty wet La Nina cycle rains, and now the Indian Ocean Diapole is negative on the West Coast, so it's wet. So what I do is for those of you around in the Black Saturday fires and the fires of 2019-20, we've just been watching the news in the last month about fires in Northern Europe and North America. Um, that helps put the context for our talks tonight. So fires as globe heats, as climate change worsens, are increasingly burning in moderate to extreme to catastrophic fires, our forest ecosystems and other ecosystems. That's what led to EDO and WF trying to work out what we can do to help landowners and governments and uh, land councils and corporations and NGOs who want to protect parts of forests and woodlands, particularly in the bushfire region in Southeastern Australia that did not burn or did not burn at those um, you know, high to catastrophic intensity fires. So that sets the context. Um, as for those of you who've worked in government or NGOs who, or if you've done, or academics have done research of your own mapping, WF produced uh, a, a landscape uh, prioritization process that helped identify 
where we would work with the EDO to try to support the protection of 1.4 million hectares, mainly forest and woodland across the bushfire region um, uh, in the years after the fires. Uh, uh, what we primarily looked at, and this was Dr. Martin Taylor, our, one of our protected area specialists who did the analysis, we, we built off data sets provided by the Commonwealth government. So the SNES data, the Species of National Environmental Significance envelopes for the species identified by the uh, federal government's Wildlife and Threatened Species Bushfire Recovery Expert Panel. If you follow those, that identified the plants and animals that had been significantly affected by the fires and were at greater risk of extinction or becoming threatened. So when we used those profiles and we uh, used the burnt area data from the National Indicative Aggregated Fire Extent data set, we used a 25 um, uh, kilometre buffer zone around those polygons identified in southeastern Australia. There are some that we toyed with and did not use, some data inputs such as um, forest carbon using the National Carbon Accounting System, um, the maximum potential biomass. In the end, it didn't. we did not include that, although it's very relevant, of course, to um, forest carbon protection in those unburnt forest areas because there was a lot of correlation with the SNES data in terms of threatened species and ecosystems that held a lot of the threatened species, which are particularly the tall wet sclerophyll forest. So we tried to have a simple analysis that was using the best available data, just mainly government data, and also land clearing data from the woody vegetation change in New South Wales and Victoria, and an analogous um, woody vegetation layer from Victoria. So uh, we went through a peer review process with the WF's eminent science group to look at how we would identify areas where we'd work on the ground and in terms of uh, working with governments who wanted to use existing private land or public land conservation mechanisms and or strengthen uh, regulatory frameworks such as around native timber harvesting, native logging, uh, land clearing and supporting restoration. So as, as you can see on the screen, we came up with six landscapes stretching from southeast Queensland to east Gippsland. They are the border ranges on the border between Queensland and New South Wales. Nimboida, which is sort of north of Grafton up towards Lismore. Um, the New South Wales north coast, which is a large area around Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, Nambucky Heads, stretching up towards uh, Grafton. Yenga Wallamai around the northern and western sides of Sydney. Uh, the New South Wales south coast, which stretched a long way from the Illawarra down towards uh, Bega. And then uh, the Gippsland Eden landscape on the border between New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, so we use a spatial tool that we would then use to prioritise where we would work with EDO or landowners who want to, or governments who want support and advisory input on where to focus limited dollars and to leverage the existing uh, mechanisms that are on the books for, for example, private land conservation. Uh, the, the analyses um, are comparable to some of the use of governments um, by the state governments and the federal government and others, uh, but there are some differences depending on which are the data inputs to use. This is the one we've used. We found it quite good. Uh, to be honest, I think when we have the next big fires in the years ahead, we will improve our analyses like we all will. Uh, but it was, uh, it was uh, a good process to go through. And our communications team, they, in terms of engaging with our supporter base and the broader public, uh, asked the conservation team to identify iconic species, particularly uh, mammals and birds, which uh, can represent those ecosystems that people are mainly in the city or don't travel into these areas or from abroad, they're amazed by Australian wildlife, but really get to see them. So the six species we identified, to be honest, they could have been uh, applied to any of those six landscapes. They weren't uh, in, you know, solely uh, associated at all with those landscapes, but they are more for illustrative purposes. They are Albert and superb flybirds in the border ranges, Patapus in the Nimboida, koala around the north coast, gray-headed flying fox, Yengo wallamai, spotted tail quoll on the south coast, and greater glider in the Gippsland Eden area. Since we've done this work, both koala and the southern and, um, and central 
uh, greater gliders had been uplisted to endangered under EPBC. And I think it was only on Monday, might have been this week, that um, uh, the main Southeast Australian population of glossy black cockatoos were also listed as threatened. So uh, unfortunately, it seems to be we focus on species which are on a downward spiral. There are some hope for some of these species. And in some populations, there is evidence where they are rebuilding their populations. And some of WF's work with koalas alongside many, many, many others across all sectors of, of society are seeing koalas recovering in some areas where the threats are managed. So there's always hope, uh, but to be honest, it was a fairly stark uh, process to go through to identify where the, uh, the unburnt or less burnt forest and woodlands within these six uh, regions are that we should work on. Uh, at least, next slide. Okay, this is my only other slide, so I'll talk through this. So um, why is it important to protect unburnt areas? And particularly now, if you've been out in the forest and the bush in the last few years, there's been a lot of regrowth, a lot of economic um, shooting from eucalypts, particularly a lot of weeds, a lot of the more fire adapted species, such as wattles growing back um, in areas that were burnt, at, even at catastrophic and high and extreme intensity. So it's important to remember why the bushfires had such a large impact, which came after years of drought, and then were preceded by, of course, massive rainfall and, and extreme flood events. We've been having those for the last two and a half years. So to recap, unburnt areas are essential for providing habitat and refuge for wildlife. As you know, a lot of our forests and a lot of our wildlife are adapted to bushfires. They require uh, fires. Pyrogenic species often require fires and smoke and the ash in the soil to uh, for seeds to re-sprout after fires. A lot of wildlife can evade fires by flying away, hopping away, uh, burrowing underground. There's a great piece uh, in, the, in the news, I think only last week, about the number of animal species that use wombat burrows for, for hiding during um, bushfires and drought and extreme heat waves. So, uh, I tell myself when I get down, and I can get pretty down about some of this stuff, as, as a lot of us do, our nature is tough. It bounces back. We are pushing it beyond a lot of its limits. But I refuse to lose hope that we can't save these species and all these forests and help adjust the trajectory that the forests are going through as uh, the world warms to save as much of the forest and wildlife as we can. Maybe different forests and woodlands in the future. Um, but we should always be hopeful that when we save uh, unburnt or less burnt areas as refuge, a lot of wildlife can survive there, particularly if there's good hollow bearing areas or areas underground or where there's dense pockets of rainforest or humid forest where species can survive the, um, the, the lack of habitat afterwards and lack of food resources. Secondly, it's important to provide climate change refuge for plants and animals that shelter in um, deeper gullies, wetter gullies, uh, in areas where there's cleared land, like on farmland or grazing land around them, there's pockets of vegetation in uh, the agricultural landscapes. Very important along floodplains and river flats where um, good water resources, uh, good quality foliage for foliables like koalas and gliders. Uh, and also in rocky areas where um, rocks provide shelter, both for animals, which like rock wallabies, which can hide and, and lizards, some of the smaller mammals in the rock crevices, but also can uh, prevent fire, uh, particularly the, the lower to moderate intensity fire, and lower ground cover fire from moving to habitat. Um, and as we, Australia will sooner rather than later move back into an Nino cycle and um, a positive Indian Ocean dipole, we will see hotter weathers, climate extremes, drying out, uh, stronger winds, lower humidity, um, uh, affecting our landscapes and putting those recovering forests and the wildlife populations at risk. Thirdly, uh, protecting unburnt areas is very important for delivering ecosystem services, including storing forest carbon. Since those fires, we've had the Glasgow Climate COP and particularly the Glasgow Climate Declaration on Forest and Land Use, which identify the key role in nature-based solutions uh, around forest ecosystems, blue carbon, um, grasslands, um, soil carbon, agricultural landscapes, shrublands for storing carbon. 
Uh, Australia has uh, very su substantial carbon storage opportunities, even though we've got very old weathered soils and we have extreme weather. Um, and we've had the federal government commit to a 43% nationally determined contribution by 2030. That's going to be a very heavy lift and our natural ecosystems will have to have a key role in that. I don't know if anyone saw Federal Agriculture Minister uh, Murray Watts' comments at the Rural Press Club in the last few days talking about the importance of um, coming to a resolution on land clearing and management of trees, including in agricultural and forested landscapes, for storing carbon and saving wildlife, but also um, ensuring that um, primary producers are able to access markets where there's glowing global and financial markets pressure to remove embedded carbon and deforestation risks from supply chains. So it's important that we manage forests for storing carbon and those in Victoria will be very familiar with you know, the long discussions over the future of forestry uh, in uh, Victoria. The, Timber plan, you've got an election coming up in November this year, where of course the future of the Central Highlands and East Gippsland and other areas like Wombat State Forest are actively in the media. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, passion on both sides of that discussion. Um, often the forest carbon storage benefits are not fully taken into account as decisions are made on how quickly to phase out native forest blocking. In Victoria, um, Victoria uh, WA uh, and Queensland and New South Wales and Tasmania. And finally, building resilience within landscapes, um, particularly species, uh, uh, animals that disperse over long distances across landscapes from forests that are cleared to agricultural to urban landscapes require habitat to move safely. And uh, this goes to both ensuring they've got places to feed and to nest and to den but also protection from invasives such as feral cats, um, foxes and wild dogs, and allows the flow of genes uh, from plants and animals across the landscape over ecological time scales as um, inland New South Wales and including Northern uh, Victoria, north of, of the divide dries out and those high elevation and more coastal catchments and forested areas where there is uh, good humidity, good soils, uh, good rainfall and active management, whether it's on park, on private land to manage fire risks. So we need to look at not just the areas, which only might be a couple of hectares or tens of hectares, maybe hundreds of hectares of forest that did not burn during the 2019, 2020 or burn at low to moderate intensity. It's still very important for providing um, stepping stones across the landscape and allowing connectivity um, and building resilience as the landscapes uh, will will switch back to a drying period in the years ahead. I think that's all for me. I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Stu. Lots of compelling reasons why it's important to protect un the unburnt there. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over what land private land conservation is. Next slide, please, please. Thank you. All right, so put simply, private land conservation involves a landholder voluntarily agreeing to conserve, to conserve some or all of their land for biodiversity. There are some options that um, also deal with the cultural values of land, particularly Aboriginal cultural heritage, but private land conservation is, is, is mainly concerned with biodiversity protection. And there's two main ways you can go about in um, private conservation. The first is by entering into some form of private conservation agreement with a provider. And this is probably the most common option. And we have um, many of the providers in Victoria here with us tonight. And the second is by registering um, your property with a private conservation program. So without an agreement. And again, we've got some representatives of those schemes here tonight too. Private land conservation agreements um, might be intended to last forever, or they can be for a set period of time. But while the agreement's in place, the landholder is tend to be bound by that agreement. And they can also bind future owners of the land, depending on, on what the agreement says. 
nearly all agreements will restrict what can be done um, to the protected area. So it might restrict um, clearing, uh, livestock grazing or developing the land. It really depends. And the idea is, is so that the biodiversity values are protected. Some agreements will also be accompanied by a management plan, and that will require the landholder to undertake active management actions, such as controlling pests and weeds or fencing the, um, certain areas off to exclude stock. So in that way, the biodiversity values of the land can be improved over time. The landholder and the provider will negotiate the agreement and any management actions required. So they're very much able to be tailored to the individual circumstances of the landholder and their property. Nearly all the options available offer some level of landholder support to those participating in the scheme. And this could be educational, technical or financial support or a combination of all of those. Next slide, Elise. In terms of who the, the providers are generally, um, some agreements are made with a government body and others are made with environmental NGOs. So for example, Humane Society International. It's important to note that as the landholder, you continue to own the land and you're responsible for complying with the agreement. <clears throat> Next slide. Choosing the right agreement is going to depend on your personal preferences and circumstances. We can provide uh, further information, um, particularly to landholders who are considering entering into a legally binding private conservation agreement. Uh, you can apply for legal assistance through our website. So check that out for more information. But if you're seriously considering private land conservation, you may also need to seek tax and financial advice, depending on your circumstances. There are a whole range of things that you need to weigh up when choosing a private conservation option. Um, I've set some of those out for you here. The first is obviously the level of protection that will be provided. So some will provide a really high level of protection um, that will last forever. And others are kind of more of an opt-in, opt-out um, kind of uh, scheme. So it, it depends on what you want to do with the land and how much protection you want to give it. You may also need to look at the level of support that will be available to you. So as I said, most schemes will provide some level of support, be it educational, technical, or financial. Um, some schemes provide significant financial incentives um, in the form of grants or one-off payments. The duration of the agreement is also really important. Um, some will bind future landholders um, and in, in, they do that by being registered on the title so that they, they, they um, run with the land. Um, and others will be easily terminated by a current or a future landholder. You may also want to look into startup costs, including the costs of seeking uh, any legal or financial advice that you might require. And in other instances, you may need to do a survey of the land or have the, uh, the land um, uh, assessed for its biodiversity values up front. You also need to think about what land management requirements there are, if any. So the, the management actions are negotiated as part of the agreement and they can be tailored to each property. Um, they typically include things like managing pests and fencing, like I said earlier. You need to feel comfortable that you can carry out the management actions, especially if your agreement is legally binding. You'll also want to consider what the potential impacts on your property might be. And this will depend on many factors specific to the land and to any potential purchaser. But you should not assume that private conservation will reduce the value of your property. Some purchasers might be willing to pay a premium for properties that ha have high biodiversity values and that are well protected. So seek advice about that um, if, if required. It's also important to consider enforcement. If the agreement's legally binding, you should look at what enforcement action is available to the provider. And this can range from a warning letter 
right through to criminal prosecutions and civil enforcement in some cases. The non-binding options are not legally enforceable against the landholder. So there's lots to consider, um, and all of this is covered in a publication um, that we've already prepared um, on private land conservation, and that's available through our website. At the end of this presentation, I'll provide you with a QR code so that you can um, follow the link straight to, the, to where it lives on our website. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Peter Mulheron now. He's the president of, the land, of land Conservation Victoria, and he's going to tell you all about this exciting new organisation. Welcome, Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Jamila. Um, and welcome. I'm coming from the Bunwurrung country down in Bass, Bass Coast, which is just east of Western Port Bay. Um, I've got a land covenant down there. And uh, so I've, I've been living it, I guess, for the last 15 years, and it's highly recommended. So, so it really does attract a lot of, um, you know, a lot of biodiversity, but a lot of animals, a couple of deer, which we need to deal with, but it's a bit of a magnet in the, in the local environment for um, you know, the kangaroos, the bird life, the unbelievable you know, small plant life and that, it's just really rewarding. So um, Land Covenanters, Victoria was formed probably about, started forming about 18 months ago and then in earnest about 12 months ago. And we need to thank um, Rendiri Trust and Eco Gips for that. They, um, it was a bit of inquiries from Trust for Nature and then the need was recognised and um, we've kicked off in earnest. So we're, we're about bringing current and future covenanters together. So there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a central body, if you like, for Victoria to bring landholders with private covenants together. And that, that's where we come in. And we're very much about sharing the knowledge. So we're, we're building up, and, and there's another slide there about numbers, but we're building up that body of knowledge through people um, and, and remembering that we're independent. So we're not, we're not attached to trust for nature. We're not a trust attached to government. We're focused on the landholders. So um, not, not for profit and member driven. There's, there's currently 64, so those are the red dots, 64 members with covenants. And then we've got friends, friends and um, inter interested parties. So we're building up that network. Of the land covenanters in Victoria, there's between 1,500 and 1,700. So this, that map will be all red by the time we uh, mature, if you like. And um, we're looking at that connectivity and, and holding on to um, you know, native habitat and, and providing that habitat for insurance species and um, you know, maximising the opportunity. Um, you, you touched on that, Stuart. You know, we, can't, we can't lose hope. We refuse to lose hope. And we need to build up that capability and that, that mass, that biodiversity regions for those native native animals to come back in. Um, uh, the next slide there, I think is, please. So we're looking for those other 17, well, uh, what is it, 1630 members to, to come on, join us and contribute to the body of knowledge. So we've, we've got a really, really strong team at the minute. Um, and we've got a survey there for, you know, we're wanting to survey new members. So we'll be making a phone call, understanding what your needs are, what your interests are, and, and what it is you're wanting from an organisation like us. There's a pretty active group at the minute looking at, at a, what we see as a barrier, which is a land tax and rates. So on one hand, government is, is supporting offsets and you know, has carbon targets. We're creating, we're, we're sequestering the carbon, we're creating the biodiversity habitat, but there's, there's an impost of land tax and, and rate, rate rebates from local councils. So I think there's 79 or about 79 LGA, local government areas within Victoria. There's not consistency around how they deal with rates and, and rate rebates. So, so it goes, goes from zero up to, up to no benefit, no, no discount 
for rates. And you know, one of our advocacy areas is to say there needs to be consistency. So that when someone's coming in to say, let's, let's put a, co a covenant on our private land, there's not that burden. There's a, not that you know, inconsistent cost, I guess. So um, we've, we've got a student project underway through RMIT University, and we're gonna do a bit of research in that. And we're, of course, we're looking for more, more interest from uh, members. Um, and then that exemption. So thanks for that. Next slide. So um, a big part of this is interviewing the new members when they come in and, and getting feedback from them about you know, what they need. We're mentoring and, and volunteering programs. So you know, a, a lot of my time is spent in talking and, and this, this sort of presentation. There's a couple more coming up. Um, as we're working very well, I'm working very closely with Landcare, but Landcare is a, a significant aligned organisation. And of course, they're running field days and workshops, etc. Um, we'll be doing a similar thing. There's, there's been one up, up north of the state already. Um, and we're interested in keeping members and keeping that community of land covenanters you know, both motivated, you know, informed, and you know, as the community supporting where we can. There's also a lot of technical information that we can reach into Trust for Nature, DELP, and, and the other stakeholders here that you know, collectively we're a lot stronger than, than as silos, if you like. So helping members to connect to those different resources. And get involved. Join us. There's a there's a there's a link there to our um, to our website. We're looking for you know, sharing those ideas, planning future events. We've got an event. I think it's close to the end of this year, maybe early next year. But you'll you'll need to stay tuned for that. So we'll be having a gathering and a you know social event. Um, and and certainly we're on the growth trajectory, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you, Peter. Um, I think I, I have to apologise. I think I mispronounced the name of the organisation. Um, it's Land Covenanters um, Victoria. Um, and it's a fantastic okay. initiative. Uh, I think that rates issue is so important. So I wish you all the best with your advocacy around that. Oh, th thanks a lot. And the land taxes. Yeah, yeah that too. I'll yeah, just get absolutely. that in. <laughs> I mean, whatever we can do to yeah. remove barriers to the uptake of, yeah. of private conservation is, is fantastic. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. It is, a, I guess it's a bit of a contradiction. It's a bit of a hangover. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we know the importance of biodiversity and, you know, climate and carbon sequestration, so. Well, all the best. So we're now going to dive into the private conservation options available to you in Victoria. And um, you'll have to stick with me for a little bit longer. Um, because the first up we've got Land for Wildlife um, and unfortunately uh, no one from Land for Wildlife could make, join us tonight, so I'm going to take you through it. So under the Land for Wildlife program, landholders voluntarily register their properties to indicate they're committed to managing their property for nature conservation. It's provided for um, through the Victorian government at this stage and in terms of the duration, you can opt out of this scheme at any time. So it's not legally binding. Um, and then future landholders can choose whether or not to participate in the scheme. There's no specific land eligibility criteria. Um, the only real requirement for participation in the scheme is for landholders to incorporate nature conservation into their land management practices. And you can do this in a multitude of ways. You might retain, protect uh, remnant native veg. You might allow leaf litter and fallen logs and branches to, to stay on the ground and provide habitat. Um, you could restrict uh, your livestock from accessing stream banks. You could fence off natural wetlands leave river snags um, in place as fish habitat, uh, protect hollow bearing trees, uh, plant local trees, shrubs and grasses, that sort of thing. So registration for, with Land for Wildlife carries no legal obligations and it cannot be enforced against you. 
there is some non-financial support available to participating landholders, and that includes an on-site visit to provide advice and answer any questions, COVID pending, advice about how landholders can contribute to biodiversity conservation. They hold field days and neighbourhood days and open properties and information sessions, so a fair bit of peer-to-peer -peer, um, engagement and learning. Um, there's a regular Land for Wildlife newsletter with lots of information. Uh, there's Land for Wildlife notes with detailed information on specific topics. And there's a much coveted Land for Wildlife sign if your property is fully registered. If you're interested in Land for Wildlife, uh, you can search them up on the internet. And you join by um, completing an application form, which is online. Um, or you can post it in, um, all the details are on their website. There's no uh, cost to you for participating in this scheme. And as there are no uh, tax property value or legal implications, it wouldn't be necessary um, to obtain independent advice before signing up. So that's Land for Wildlife. <clears throat> Next up, we have Indigenous protected areas, and these aren't exclusive to Victoria. These are a national uh, scheme. And an IPA is an area of land or sea country that traditional owners have voluntarily agreed to manage for conservation. And the agreement is made with the Australian government. These agreements are accompanied by a management plan which sets out how country, its natural and its cultural values, um, and any threats to those values will be managed. Management plans are negotiated between traditional custodians and the Australian government, and they'll be tailored to the particular country that they relate to. Once they're declared, an IPA forms part of Australia's national reserve system and quite makes a really significant contribution uh, to biodiversity conservation in Australia. Like a significant amount of our national estate is, is in IPA form. Um, these agreements can also really help um, Indigenous communities to protect the cultural values of their country for future generations. And research shows that they can result in significant health, education, economic and social benefits. In terms of their duration, um, individual IPAs set out how, um, how long they're, they're going to last and how they can be terminated if, if they can be terminated. In terms of land eligibility criteria, they can apply to land or sea country. They can apply to a range of land tenures, including national parks, local government reserves, private land, native title land, um, and areas that are under co-management agreements. In terms of support, IPA projects are supported through a multi-year funding agreement. Many Indigenous organisations also supplement this funding through a fee-for-service or other income-generating activities, um, as well as support from private sector and philanthropic organisations. And the framework itself encourages uh, traditional custodians to enter partnerships with conservation and commercial organisations to provide employment, education and training opportunities for Indigenous people through the scheme. There's no application process. Uh, the agreements are, are negotiated between the traditional custodians and the Australian government. And that happens through the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Before they can be declared, there needs to be a fair amount of community consultation um, and a plan of management needs to be prepared, which can be a bit of work and can take a bit of time. The Australian government can support traditional custodians uh, through that consultation and, and plan of management process. Uh, we recommend that any traditional custodians um, interested in entering into an IPA uh, seek independent legal advice before they do it and, um, and, that, and also get some support uh, through the process. Okay, it's time to hand over to Ben Williams, who is going to tell us about Trust for Nature's Conservation Covenants. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Jim, very much appreciated. G'day all. Um, hello from uh, sunny East Gippsland. Uh, this morning at my place, it was minus 3.4 degrees. Um, the hose had frozen over. I couldn't even uh, clear my windscreen. Uh, I have no idea why they make them that cold. I just don't think it's necessary. 
Anyway, um, as I said, my name is Ben Williams. I'm a Senior Conservation Officer and also the Lead Covenanting Officer for Trust for Nature here in East Gippsland. And I think the best way for me to sort of give you a rundown on how uh, Trust for Nature works is uh, sort of going over what we can do for private land conservation and, and I suppose how we roll. So Trust for Nature is a non-for-profit organisation and we are funded through governmental grants and also quite a lot of philanthropic donations. One of the oldest conservation organisations in Australia and our mission is to protect and restore biodiversity on private land in Victoria. Uh, we were established in 1972 uh, through the Victorian Conservation Trust Act and uh, this year's our 50th year anniversary, so uh, we're pretty stoked about that. And in our time, we've protected, thank you very much, Bert, we've protected uh, over 180,000 uh, hectares of private land forever, which is just an amazing accomplishment. And, uh, and it's a tip of the hat to, to, uh, to um, private landowners who have the same visionary sort of descriptors as what we do. It's great to work with some of these people. Um, so some of the stuff that we've protected at least in the last um, 12 months or so, we've had a really big year. Um, we've protected all sorts of threatened species and communities, for example, uh, the critically endangered helmeted honey eater, uh, the critically endangered plains wanderer, the vulnerable powerful owl, the platypus, and the gray-headed flying fox, just amazing organisms. From a flora perspective, we've been really successful in the last 12 months in protecting the endangered honey caladenia. Uh, the dwarf carawang, uh, the endangered river hook sedge, and the endangered bonnet and leaflet tongue orchids, the cryptostyles, it's amazing, amazing little organisms there as well. They're so rare and so beautiful. Or orchids completely do it for me every single time. Also, um, uh, different... And they're all different types of landscapes that are... Uh, that are threatened um, throughout uh, throughout Victoria. Um, we've we've saved plenty of warm and cool temperate rainforests, some blackthorn scrub, montane riparian woodlands, and also some riverine escarpment scrub. They're all very rare and they're all very gentle and delicate. Obviously, in East Gippsland, we copped a uh, a severe brunt of fires over the 2019-2020 fires, and to uh, have areas set aside for refugia is just so important to us and so important to um, flora and fauna throughout Victoria. We offer conservation in a number of different ways and uh, it's not only uh, with the conservation covenant, but we participate with our um, covenanters with weed control, um, revegetation projects, some vertebrate, vertebrate pest control and fencing as well for ecological significant areas. Um, as well as the Conservation Covenant. Last year here in East Gippsland, we uh, did over just under 300 hectares of weed control, which is a huge sum for all eight of us here in the office. Um, we re-vegged over 100 hectares, which is an incredible effort as well. Um, we controlled all sorts of nasty, nasty deer, foxes and rabbits and pigs across the landscape, over a total of 2,400. 52 hectares, which is a big target to, uh, to have met, met as well, as well as um, excluding a, a number of um, threatened communities and threatened species with um, exclusion fencing and so on. Now, the Conservation Covenant, I suppose, is our primary instrument of, uh, of conservation, and it functions in the same sort of way I, saw, I, I suggest as a... Uh, as a, an overlay on a tidal act. So a lot of people have environmental significance overlays or cultural heritage overlays on a tidal. And uh, a, a covenant on tidal is there in perpetuity. It's there forever. A, and the purpose of that is um, it, it protects the land and it protects the communities, not only um, with yourselves, but not look. Normally, if uh, if people have come to us um, chasing a conservation covenant, we're already we're already um, we already have the same sort of train of thought. In perpetuity um, means that it is protected um, from then on. So it is not only the next landowner; it's the next landowner and the next landowner. Um, so it protects against things like um, landscape degradation, 
um, clearfelt logging, new power lines that can go through a property, uh, private mine applications, and and things like that. So so it's it, it's not so much protecting the property against yourself because the landowner who has approached us has already you know the, the right frame of mind we just don't know what's going to happen to that that parcel of land in the future so in perpetuity is very important um jim you did mention before that um land conservation sort of um has a few caveats attached to it yes that's true i suppose but it doesn't um you have to understand that these things are for beneficial purposes Make no mistakes. We we suggest uh, we uh, support firewood collection. We support walking dogs through covenants. We, we support track maintenance through your property. It's important to uh, access your uh, your property, and we support we support burning in situations as well. Um, so it's uh, it's not it's not like uh, we're a governing body. Our primary function is to assist you in increasing the biodiversities and, bio, and environmental values of your property uh, overall with, with professional uh, environmental advice. Um, the covenant sort of uh, implemented by a number of key documents. One of them in particular is the deed of covenant and that is pretty much a legal document that talks about uh, what you can and can't do on your property um it, it's it's the main legal one that the the minister ends up signing off on that's also accompanied with the management plan as jen mentioned a little bit earlier that's basically um a, a document where we go over your entire property we do vegetational surveys we do habitat hectares uh and essentially measure your property see how its values are and then also suggest some things that uh will improve those biodiversity values and conservation values um, things like, you know, suggesting weed control, suggesting vertebrate pest control, so um, so they don't sort of take their toll on the property. Um, and there's also letters of approval, which make up the um, the entire covenant. So a letter of approval is essentially uh, where the deed says there are no dogs to be on the property. A letter of approval outweighs that and allows you to take dogs onto your property. Um, the reason being is, as I said earlier, a covenant is in perpetuity and we don't know what we're going to encounter in the future with the next owners and so on. Um, so that's essentially how the covenant is uh, gets underway. Um, also, the trust has multiple fingers in multiple pies. Uh, we're donated bequeathed properties and um, have purchased properties through donations. And we, uh, we still run those as reserves. So we have quite a few of those all throughout Victoria. And there's also another option um, we offer, which is the revolving fund. And the revolving fund is a, a mechanism that allows us to purchase your property uh, when you wanna sell it. We uh, install a conservation covenant on that title, and then we sell it on after. Uh, that seems to be an ever growing popular option for people selling bush blocks and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it, it just seems that we're constantly, constantly inundated with um, people wanting support, people needing that, that cover. We, we have people walking in straight off the street asking for properties um, that have conservation covenants on there uh, that, that are available for purchase. And uh, so it's, it's really good to see that the public's becoming more and more aware of how important private land is to conserve and those key areas of, uh, of you know, endangered species and communities can be, um, can be rebuilt in those refugia areas and, uh, and, and help maintain those good levels of, of, um, of life on earth. That's about all I have for you, Jen. If there's any other questions, I'm quite happy to field them. That's awesome, Ben. Thank you so much. Um, it is so great to hear that there's a strong appetite for covenants in Victoria. Um, and, it, you know, congratulations on 50 years. That's incredible. Yeah, it's great. No, it's great. Look, it, it's it's something that I have no issues in uh, in talking people through. I just believe in the model so greatly, greatly. I just think it's one of the greatest things you can do for private land conservation. It's just a, a magnificent mechanism. And I've got to thank Peter as well for just such a great organisation, such a great initiative. I think 
that land covenant is Victoria the organisation just gives support where sometimes it's difficult us with us with such little staff to sort of maintain such a big stronghold of, of covenanters. So I appreciate that very much. Um, we'll look if you forward have to working together. Same, Peter. If you have a question for Ben, uh, feel free to put it in the in the Q&A function um, and we'll ask it of Ben a bit later on. I'm going to hand you over now to Helen Church from Humane Society International, um, who's going to tell you about Wildlife Land Trust. Welcome, Helen. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. My name is Helen and I manage the Wildlife Land Trust. Um, this is Humane Society International's private land conservation program. And for those of you who don't know, Humane Society International is a animal welfare and conservation charity. Um, and the Wildlife Land Trust is just one of our many initiatives to preserve wildlife and their habitats throughout Australia and in Victoria. Um, so our program is mainly focused on inclusivity um, our agreements are flexible, they're non-binding, and our memberships are completely free. Um, at the moment, we have just over 800 members across Australia, and these are ranged from one acre to several thousand, so pretty much any property is welcome to join. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so who can join? Uh, most of our sanctuaries are mixed use. Um, a lot of our members are wildlife carers. Uh, they can be farmers who are managing their land sustainably and ecotourism ventures, all sorts. Um, basically, you're welcome to join as long as you're managing land for the benefit of wildlife and their habitat in your area. Um, our membership is not legally binding. Our members can opt out of our program at any time and our agreements don't carry any sort of legal obligations. Um, if you do choose to sell your property, it's very easy to transfer that membership onwards. So it's quite a flexible, easy agreement to work around and to opt out of if you ever need to. Um, our agreements are also designed to complement any of the other programs that you've heard about in this webinar. Um, we can also help you explore further options for stepping up protection on your land if you ever need it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what's in it for you? The main part of the Wildlife Land Trust, the main benefit is that you get to join a community of uh, conservation-minded landowners who uh, are like-minded, really. Um, so in this network, you can share your stories about conservation, um, connect with other members in your area, or maybe people who have uh, the same issues or the same land types as you. And you can learn more about conserving wildlife and their habitat through this peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, you do receive a free property sign, a uh, picture of one there. Uh, this is a really great way to connect with your neighbors and maybe start the conversation about private land conservation with them as well. Um, you do receive any advice and support that you need. So we have a few expert ecologists on hand and we can help you with conservation issues, both within your property and in your local area or your local community as well. Um, we also occasionally do have some grants available. Um, these do include Humane Society International's grants, such as our disaster response funding. Um, next slide, please. We do also have a few other programs within the Wildlife Land Trust, which um, just can help you support you in your conservation uh, work. So the first off one we have is Sanctuaries for Sale. Pretty much in the name, we can help you find a like-minded buyer for your property. Um, it can be pretty hard to sell your property when you're, you've been working on regenerating it and conserving it for so long. Um, so we can promote it to people who might appreciate, you know, the natural values of it and can carry on managing it and caring for it for the wildlife and habitat there. And we also have a very successful Sanctuaries You Can Stay program. 
So with this, we can promote your eco-friendly tourism or accommodation programs on your land. Um, this can be promoted to all of our supporters and any sort of wildlife friendly travelers. Um, I highly recommend it if you also are traveling within Australia. It's a really good option to, um, to support local businesses and get involved in some of those off the beaten track uh, wildlife experiences that you might not know about in some areas. So yeah, definitely take a look if you're thinking about traveling in Australia. And yeah, we do hope to hear from you. Um, in conclusion, this is a really good option for people who are maybe just taking the first steps into private land conservation. Uh, maybe if you are not eligible for other programs or if you just don't like the idea of anything too permanent or binding on your properties. Uh, I highly recommend it. Do feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is there. And you can also head to our website, um, which has some really great resources and some more information about our program. Thanks. Thank you so much, Helen. A great option there for anyone wanting to dip their toe into private land conservation. And they do amazing work generally um, right across Australia and internationally to help protect biodiversity. So a great organization all round. Um, next up and lucky last, we have Dr. Andrew Warnock from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Um, Andrew's going to take us through our final option tonight. I've forgotten what it's called. Andrew, you'll have to introduce it for me. No, that's all right. So um, I wanted to talk about the Conservation Forests and Lands Act um, and options to protect and enhance biodiversity values within properties under a Section 69 agreement under that very act. Um, so I've been working, um, I guess, in the native vegetation um, space for uh, 15 or so years, um, working sort of the offset space, both as a consultant and more recently within the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Um, so the text in front of you, I guess, is just the, the clause from the, um, from the Conservation Forests and Lands Act. Um, um, but basically what, if you go to the next slide, perhaps, um, basically what that is, is just a legally binding agreement between the landholder and um, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Um, and it's used for a range of purposes, usually relating to conservation, um, usually in perpetuity, so forever. It usually applies to all future landowners. Um, and what it does is provide an opportunity for landowners to protect the environmental assets um, against future threats, um, I guess being environmental threats, as well as, I guess, potential um, future landowners who might not have the same um, commitments to conserve the land, um, and also opportunities to receive financial benefits for undertaking those conservation actions and increasing the obligations, or I guess, of the restrictions of the land, such as protection of the native vegetation. Um, if you can get to the next slide, please. Um, so it's used for a number of different um, programs, um, carbon offsetting agreements um, being one of them and various conservation agreements um, such as grants. Uh, I don't think there's any current grants available, but they do appear from time to time. Um, one of the programs currently running or just sort of, I think the grants just closed off is Bushbank. Um, so that website there, I guess, gives a link to the potential grants that are open. So it's worthwhile people having a look at that and just keeping an eye on that website if it's something you're interested in doing. Um, I think next year we might have some more Bush Bank opportunities grants available. And I guess that's an opportunity for funding um, and the mechanism, I guess, to uh, enact the conservations via the Section 69 agreement. But what I wanted to focus on today is biodiversity offsets, um, which is to protect um, both Commonwealth um, matters of significance as well as state matters of significance and native vegetation. Um, I'll repeat that website if you haven't written it down and I'm happy to share my slide as well on the next slide. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so the offsetting program, I guess the crux of it really is around the guidelines for the removal, destruction or lopping of native vegetation, um, which outlines, I guess, the processes for 
permitted removal of native vegetation for various purposes. It might be for a, a housing, um, construction of a house or a road or various, various matters, whatever the reason is, people are removing native vegetation across the state. It provides, I guess, uh, an objective to ensure there's no net loss to biodiversity as a result of that removal. Um, and that's achieved through um, increasing the quality and quantity of native vegetation or habitat within offset sites across the state. Um, noting the key principle, I guess, of those guidelines is at first avoid removal of native vegetation and only if that's not feasible, um, minimising, and if that's not feasible, offsetting. So I guess it's a three-tiered approach and offsetting being the last um, tier to that sort of three-tiered approach. So it's important to sort of recognise that. Um, and so if somebody's removing vegetation within Victoria, that requires to be offset, and that can be done by proponents for two, two mechanisms. Um, they can protect and manage vegetation on their own property, um, but in some cases, they might not be able to do that or um, they choose not to, in which case, I guess, which is the key to sort of what I wanted to chat about today is they need to get an off-site, uh, off-site offset site. And they'll do that through purchasing credits from a third party. So landowners, such as many of those here today, I guess, have an opportunity to protect and manage vegetation and I guess um, as a form of sort of compensation for that um, can receive sort of funding um, through the offset program. Um, I guess some people sort of feel that I hesitant, I guess, to support development within Victoria, which is sort of understandable. And I guess that's something that I've sort of thought about through my sort of entire career in environmental management, because lots of it unfortunately is attached to development. But I guess what it does is give you the opportunity to protect um, and manage vegetation within your property and make sure sort of values that you might have are protected and managed um, and those offsets are going to sort of a good a good home. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to brief because it gives a good context talk about, I guess, the offsetting system before we go to the sort of what it might mean for you. Um, there's two broad types of offsets um, required in Victoria, one being general habitat units. And that's, I guess, if you're uh, general vegetation um, within the state, I guess, to provide the context, the alternative offset type is uh, threatened species, uh, for threatened species habitat, species habitat units. And they're required where any removal is having a significant impact on a threatened species habitat. Um, and I'll provide more context for both of those in the following slide, if we can. So a general habitat unit, um, if somebody requires a general habitat unit, that can be achieved anywhere within the Catchment Management Authority region, the CMA region um, across Victoria. Um, it doesn't need to be the same vegetation type. I guess that used to be part of the state policy, but um, it was just very difficult for, um, I guess, to navigate the system with that sort of complexity. So it's been simplified um, with general habitat units. Um, but it does need to provide a similar landscape importance. And that's what we refer to as a strategic biodiversity value, which is that map on the right hand side. And it sort of just uh, ensures development in key biodiversity hotspots um, are offsetting sort of key biodiversity hotspots and also encourages landowners in key biodiversity hotspots like um, the Grampians or like Wilson's Prime or French Island um, and those sorts of areas um, encourage those landowners to protect the, the value of their land. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, the other the other offset type is species habitat units. Um, and if somebody has a significant impact on a threatened species habitat, they require offsets for that particular threatened species. And they can achieve those any in the, anywhere in the state, but they do have to provide the offset site does have to provide habitat for that species. Um, and that's based on modelled habitat. Um, I guess the rationale for using the modelled habitat is that we used to have a policy where it required sort of site assessments to determine whether a site provided model habitat or not. Um, that is still part of the process, but um, when solar relies on, I guess, the site assessment, we get five different assessors all giving five different answers because it gets pretty easy for like, a, I don't know, a threatened eucalypt or something because you can easily see it and ID it. But if it's a threatened fauna, you can do your threatened species surveys and not find them, but you're still, the species might not be that might be there, just not on there on that day. So it kind of ends up being the opinions of the assessor. 
um, and you get lots of different conflicting assessments, which it's difficult for people to navigate the system and provides a lot of um, uncertainty for various stakeholders in the system. So it's based on model to habitat, but there is fact checks along the way to make sure that habitat modeling is correct. Uh, next slide, please. So you can generate offset credits, which can be sold to third parties via a variety of means. Um, it could be via revegetation, so increasing the extent of native vegetation within Victoria. And revegetation, I guess, is basically on a blank canvas. So it could be old cropping land, old um, pastoral land, and it's about sort of planting native vegetation on there, trees and shrubs, and variety of sort of life forms to um, recreate, I guess, a natural ecosystem. The other option being to protect and manage an existing native vegetation patch, um, so a bush block people might have. Um, and so protecting that native vegetation in perpetuity and maintaining the native vegetation quality in, in perpetuity and generally improving the quality of the native vegetation quality over a 10 year period. And then over, at the conclusion of the 10 year period, it's then maintained in perpetuity by, uh, I guess, the current landowner or if they sell a property, future landowners. Um, and the third being protection of scattered trees. Um, so uh, sadly, I guess, when you drive across, uh, particularly Western Victoria, where I'm from, um, you see lots of these um, beautiful old scattered paddock trees, but there's no babies around them. And eventually those beautiful old scattered trees, which provide habitat, are eventually gonna die off by natural cause of death. Um, so if we don't make babies to replace them, um, we lose that habitat. So I guess it's an opportunity to protect the scattered trees and the area around them, allowing natural regeneration or planting to make sure that we've got that uh, stepping stone across the landscape. Next slide, please. So there ends up being a on title legal agreement, uh, which applies in perpetuity and to all future landowners, which I guess um, uh, is important to um, ensure that the values you're trying to protect, I guess, uh, don't get forgotten about once you sell a land or sort of pass on. Um, and there's no subdivision of the protected areas so that can't be carved up into the future. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't, I guess, plan for subdivision if that's what you want to do. I guess you just need to plan that. And I guess when you're establishing the offset agreement, making sure that you sort of plan where you, where that might occur, um, if that's something you want to do in the future. So I guess some people want to um, allow for potential, if there, there's no dwelling on the property, I guess allow for domestic areas and things like that. So either they or the future landowners can do something like that, doesn't restrict them. Um, and I guess what I'm primarily talking about today is section 69 agreement with DELP, um, but the, I guess the other opportunity being a, a trust for nature uh, offset, offset covenant. Um, and that on title legal agreement applies um, regardless of whether offset credits have been sold um, or how many have been sold. So that's important consideration, I guess, if you're going to make this commitment, I guess, just considering, I guess, um, uh, the market, I guess, demand for offsets and if you're comfortable in entering that agreement um, because uh, you may be able to sell offsets, but in the event you can't, I guess that agreement applies and I'll go into more about the market sort of forces later on. If we can go to the next slide, please. So talking about native vegetation patches, protection of a, you might have a great bush block um, or, or part of your property, the back box of your property with some great native vegetation, um, opportunity to protect that. So I guess the image on the left is sort of a, there's a um, photo point, but unfortunately it's not sort of uh, the, the same dead tree, I guess there is in both of the photos, so a bit of a change of frame, but left-hand side, you can see all the whorehound and other weeds. And then at conclusion of 10 years, um, lots of those high threat weeds have been removed. So it's sort of great outcome. Um, and if you're protecting no vegetation patch, um, the obligation is to, there's no removal of native vegetation, logs or leaf litter. And that includes fuel reduction burning um, or fuel reduction. Um, not saying that can't occur in the property, but I guess if you need, think you need to do some, I guess, a fuel break or something like that, you just plan where that's going to be before you establish that offset agreement. And generally excluding stock, unless it's a native grassland, because some native grasslands can benefit from strategic grazing, um, but generally excluding stock. Um, controlling pest animals, including deer. Control of weeds, I guess the baseline is ensuring there's no increase in the weed cover. Um, but then there's an option to uh, and eliminate new and, new and emerging high threat weeds, but there's an option, I guess, to eliminate 
high threat weeds, so increase your obligations and you would generate more offset credits by doing that. Um, so increased obligations, but greater sort of um, gain both in biodiversity and in sort of financial benefits potentially. Um, or I guess if you've got a woodland, but it's lacking a shrub lay, you can do some supplementary planting or introduce some logs from, uh, uh, from another source for habitat. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, protection of scattered trees, lots of the points are the same, which is why I've included those in grey, I guess, but um, uh, the key difference, I guess, is monitor for natural regeneration under the scattered trees being protected. And if they don't naturally regenerate, um, doing some planting to make sure that those babies do grow up. So we've got a photo there of, I guess, uh, the very common but sort of sad landscape of beautiful old habitat trees, but no babies, so nothing to replace them. 10 years later, um, we've got some reasonable sized saplings to sort of create new trees in and around them um, when those trees eventually uh, die off. Next slide, please. Um, the other option being revegetation. So increasing the extent um, of native vegetation, which might be on a blank sort of canvas, just a crop paddock. Um, usually of a variety of life forms um, and species with sort of similar commitments. Uh, next slide, please. And so a section 69 agreement would uh, usually include a management, well, always would include a management plan um, for 10 years of active management, um, but also management beyond the 10 year period. Um, so it is an imperpetual agreement. Um, and I guess to sort of check that our landowners are doing what they've obligated to do along the way, um, they're required to report annual, and there's an opportunity for feedback, I guess, as well, um, to sort of improve the site condition. Um, annual reporting for the first 10 years um, from the landowner, and then upon re reasonable request from DELP thereafter, which we plan to do approximately every five years. Um, and as well as DELP monitoring on ground, which uh, occurs approximately every three years for the first 10 years and approximately every five years thereafter. And that again is an opportunity to, to for discuss um, management issues and provide feedback to the landowners as well as being a, I guess, a um, checking that the sort of uh, the offset sites are being sort of um, obligations are being met. Um, so I guess if you've signed a section 69 agreement for offsets, you generate native vegetation credits. I guess they can be traded on an open market. They can be sold to third party. Um, and so DELP maintains a register of all offset sites in Victoria and credit availability um, through, uh, which can be searched on an online search tool. Um, and not only can you, um, I guess, search actual offset sites, but I guess it's a key sort of, opportunity for landowners might be present today. You can also list yourself as a potential offset site. So if you're not quite sure if you want to enter the uh, an offset agreement now, um, you may be waiting for a prospective buyer. You can list your site as a potential offset site. And then when a buyer comes along and says, yes, I'm willing to buy some credits off you, then you can sign that in perpetuity agreement, making sure you've got a guaranteed sale. Um, and they can be the credits can be sold via a broker or directly the landowner can like liaise directly with the purchaser. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I guess, how did the pricing work for offset agreements, for 669 agreements? Um, it's essentially de de determined by the landowner. So the landowner determines what price they're willing to sell their credits for, but it is an open market and so it is market driven. So I guess if there's a scarcity in the market, the landowner's um, might choose to or be able to sell them for a higher price. But I guess if there's like any market force, if there's a lot of offsets in a market, um, the landowners might be might need to drop their prices to sort of compete with other um, offset providers. And there's a range of things which Jamila sort of touched on earlier um, uh, regarding sort of considerations in develop, well, one in entering a section 69 agreement and two developing a price. I guess the establishment costs, um, the rates and the taxes. Um, thanks, Peter, for mentioning those earlier. I guess some landowners sort of working as a consultant, uh, getting so close to them protecting this threatened species habit in the last minute, they sort of ended up pulling out, unfortunately, because of concerns regarding the taxes. So it's good to see you sort of advocating for that. Um, administration costs, insurances you might need um, to cover yourself, I guess, if there's some unknown sort of uh, risk. Some landowners protect themselves against sort of wildfires, what they might need to do, increased management following that or floods and things like that. 
um, brokerage costs for your offsets um, and foregone you. So I guess maybe if you're a farmer, you'll get your loss to pasture, so therefore loss of income. Um, if you're collecting firewood, um, consider sort of the loss cost associated with the firewood collection. And I guess impacts when you would do eventually sell a property, maybe uh, I guess it would reduce, um, I guess there's opportunities there for the future landowners, um, but there's also potential um, changes to the land value if some landowners sort of might be um, willing to buy the property better to potentially reduce price. So just considering those sorts of things. Um, and management costs, not only for the 10-year period, but considering the management beyond that 10-year period. Um, and allowing for unexpected costs, because there's always sort of um, occasionally something that sort of goes unexpected. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I guess, but that is all well and good, but I guess what is the market? Availability and prices, um, that is all available on the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning website. Um, there's a sort of the first sort of uh, PDF there and the slide is pricing out of vegetation credits, which gives you guidance. But then there's also a list of all credits that are traded within Victoria, the prices that they were sold for um, and the amount per unit. So I guess the first line item, you can see somebody sold some units in the Karangamite Catchment Management Authority. They sold um, two general habitat units at $90,000 per general habitat unit. So they, for that particular trade, that landowner will receive an income of $198,000. Um, and so you can, landowners can use that to determine if that's up, if uh, a section 69 agreement is something they want to do, whether it's sort of, um, uh, as well as sort of uh, setting the, the prices they might sell them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I guess just uh, reminding landowners to do the due diligence, um, which uh, would be a number of things. I guess you can, there's a link there for the website, nvim.delp.vic.gov.au forward slash offset site. And that is an online tool which you can use to estimate the offset credits that your property would generate. So it's worth just jumping on there, drawing a polygon around, drawing a shape around your property um, and following the buttons and that'll tell you, It'll estimate how many units your offset, your, your land would provide. And then you can use the um, sort of that market information I showed in the previous slide to work out what potential sort of income you would get from managing that site. Um, you can't use that tool if you're establishing a third party offset site, but it's good to do, is do some initial due diligence to work out, is that something you're willing to do? Um, and if so, you can pursue that further. Um, and so, um, I think it was Jamala mentioned earlier, some of these points, I guess, are the threats manageable? Can you actually manage the threats on your site? And what's the likelihood of success for revegetation? I guess I love to say revegetation because it's a clear benefit biodiversity, but unfortunately sometimes it does fail. Um, and so considering, I guess, um, uh, the likelihood of revegetation on your site, sort of considering sort of like um, how arid is the site, is it on a steep escarpment where it might likely fail and things like that. Um, and your future desires and use for the lands. So obviously, it's an imperpetual agreement. So just considering what you might want to do in the future of the land so you don't sort of cut off, cut off um, opportunities that you might want to have. And looking at the market demand. So you can, I guess, regarding the market demand, you can chat to um, site assessors and brokers regarding sort of the offset demand. And they can help you also conduct some due diligence assessments, review the site eligibility, and do further in-depth analysis of the amount of gains in you would get um, for threat species habitat units and general habitat units. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I guess if you've entered one of these 669 agreements um, for offsetting, how would you be paid? I guess if there's a trade that occurs between a landowner and a purchase, credit purchaser, that money comes into the DELP trust and it is um, given back to the landowner in proportional amounts over a 10-year period. So the, the full amount of the trade will go to the landowner, but over a 10-year period. Um, so uh, receiving 35% in the first year, because there's a lot more management that needs to happen in that first year. Maybe there's some new fencing that's needed. Usually it needs more intensive weed control and pest control and things like that. And those management obligations generally decrease as the years progress. So they would save 35% in the first year, 5% the next year, and 10% in progressive amounts until you re uh, receive 100% of that trade. Um, 
and that's paid to the landowner provided that landowner is compliant with their um, section 69 agreement um, and where they're not compliant, compliant, I guess we would hold funds until um, uh, those required actions are achieved um, as well as sort of, I guess, we potentially would freeze the availability of selling those credits as well. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and so it can lead to great environmental outcomes. I guess this is just an example offset site, which it just after one year's management. Um, and it, it was an uplifting site, not only because I guess of the biodiversity, there was such clear biodiversity benefits in one year. This is a deer wallow. And the site assessor was very uh, nervous, I guess, about the ability to control deer within this site. Um, but just after one year's management, it got great conservation outcomes. And this landowner, um, I guess, not only for the biodiversity, but for the improving, I guess, the um, uh, appreciation of, of environmental values, this landowner had very little knowledge of uh, the plants and animals that were on his property um, and was paying sort of contractors to do the weed and pest control, which some of our landowners do. He found that he just wasn't getting the bang for buck out of getting contractors to do the bushland contract works. So he ended up doing, said, forget that, I'm gonna learn what weeds and pests to have on my property and do all the work myself. Um, he didn't even sort of, he, some of the weeds on site he actually planted because I guess um, he didn't know there were weed at the time. And so part of the work was removing some of the weeds he'd planted years before. Um, and I guess, yeah, through increasing, it's just seeing that increased appreciation of the nature that he was living in. And I guess deer being not only removed sort of by sort of shooting, but also his constant presence in the property because he appreciated the property so much, sort of drove the deer into other other um, sites because um, they sort of um, didn't like him being around so much. Um, so that's, yeah, that's all I wanted to sort of chat about today, but you're happy to talk about any questions that people may have. Andrew, thank you so much for such a, a comprehensive overview of Section 69 agreements and introducing us to offsetting, which is a, another way of looking at private conservation and one that can get real environmental outcomes. I also have to congratulate you because you got through a phrase that included the words offset, offsite, offset site. And you didn't stumble, <laughs> um, which I thought was really impressive. Um, okay, so that's it for the options. Before we go to questions, I just wanted to let you know that the EDO and WWF will soon be publishing a guide to the carbon market for, for landholders. So we looked at the carbon market as a possible alternative pathway for private landholders to benefit from protecting unburnt trees on their land. And this forms part of, a, of the broader defending the unburnt work that the EDO and WWF are collaborating on. So we're looking at lots of ways to defend unburnt landscapes. Private conservation is one. Um, critical habitat, um, uplisting species. There's lots of different legal mechanisms that we are looking at to try and... Um, and protect the unburnt. Um, the carbon market was a little disappointing when we looked into it. Um, we found that there are limited carbon market opportunities for protecting intact existing vegetation. And that's because in general, simply having unburnt forest on your land is not enough to meet the requirements for generating carbon credits, particularly if the current use of your land wouldn't ordinarily ret retain um, the trees in the landscape. But that said, um, this guide um, does provide an overview of the regulated national carbon market, it, which is administered by the Clean Energy Regulator. And in addition, it looks at the domestic and international voluntary carbon market, as well as some possible co-benefit opportunities uh, for projects that protect uh, biodiversity and deliver um, uh, carbon benefits as well. So um, watch this space um, because we'll be publishing this guide really soon on, on our website. Um, next slide, Elise. So this QR code will take you to um, our web page. Um, which includes all the work we've done on defending the unburnt to date. Um, we've published quite a few reports 
um, including our um, private land conservation for landholders report. So if you follow the QR code, um, it will take you to our, our web page where you can find um, that the, the private conservation guide. That covers off on everything we've, we've discussed tonight. Um, so if you didn't take it all in the first time around, you can read it at your leisure and um, consider your options a bit more carefully. I'll just give you a minute to follow that link. Oh, we've moved on. <laughs> just for those who um, didn't have their phones at the ready. Um, uh, there should be some questions in the chat. Before we go there, I'll um, just show you the last slide. It's another QR code. Um, that one is going to take you to an evaluation form. We, uh, we love to get feedback on our webinars and legal information sessions. Uh, we use this to tell our funders how we're doing and um, so that they'll keep supporting us. Um, so if you have any feedback about how we can improve, we'd love to hear it. Um, so yeah, just follow that QR code and it will take you to an evaluation form. Uh, Elise, do you want to start us off with some questions? I saw there is a bit of action in, uh, in the Q&A. Yeah, we are running pretty close to time, but I think there's quite a few that are similar. So we'll be able to get through a couple. Um, first question, probably for Ben and Andrew around um, enforcement. So we mentioned that some options can be legally enforceable and there's sort of certain management um, requirements that you need to do on your own land. And people seem to be interested in sort of how stringently um, this is checked and, and if there are um, management requirements that aren't being met, sort of what's the action that you would take against a landholder? Um, and sort of second prong of that question is if there's inadvertent impacts on your land, maybe um, activity on your neighbor's land is sort of contaminating your land. Is there a bit of a gray area there for how you sort of enforce that? Is there, yeah, sort of negotiations with landholders before you take that enforcement step? Um, I'll attempt to answer that. Um, so I guess we have a range of steps to work with landowners for compliance. Um, I guess landowners are receiving financial benefits through the Section 69 agreement. So we do need to sure, make sure that, I guess, one, that the management actions are being undertaken, um, but two, that the management targets are being met, which is why it's important for landowners to think about, I guess, can they achieve those management targets? Because um, I think it's unachievable, then I guess, perhaps not, um, I guess, dropping the bar, I guess, for commitments, because there's a range of bars that can be uh, selected. Um, and I guess the first thing we would do is, I guess, is halt payments and work with the landowner to address that threat. Um, and in some cases, it is sort of unfortunately sort of deliberate sort of, I guess, or intentional sort of um, breach of the agreement. In other cases, they're trying their best and we don't want to sort of um, wrap people across that knuckles for sort of trying their best. So we just work with the landowners to address what the real threats are and achieve those outcomes. Um, uh, but I guess we, we have a range of means. We do have legal mechanisms for enforcement, but we, we try not to go down that route if possible, because it's not the most pleasant for landowners um, or ourselves. Um, and Regarding, I guess, adjacent land, that's something to consider for site eligibility. If there's threats in the adjacent land that impact, that can't be controlled, um, potentially the site would become ineligible. Um, if it was an established offset site, um, then yeah, I guess it probably would be difficult circumstances. Um, and, uh, we haven't had a clear example of that, but usually, I guess, I, some, some cases we actually have, and we've worked with the adjacent landowners, but um, I guess it might be a potential gray area, but we can usually work with the adjacent landowners as well as the actual offset landowner to, to, to make sure those outcomes work. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. I think some of those questions sort of came in that vein of, you know, if the landowner is trying their best, is there a way you can sort of work with the covenant to, to work through that? So I think that's a really helpful answer. Mm. Then I might just follow up. Is that a similar situation with Trust for Nature as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we're very much the same as Andrew. We are 
we very much try and work with the landowners. You know, there, there's different threats that are uh, that, that can impact upon um, conservation values. Um, some of them are standard as weeds can be dealt with rather easily, but things like uh, things of an elusive nature like samba deer or, or pigs are something that are very hard to manage in a landscape. They're elusive by nature, um, and, and we can't expect a landowner to. Um, to remove all um, deer or, or pigs from their landscape because it's it's just not practicable. Um, but yeah, I think I think much as, as I said, much the same as Andrew. We try and work with the landowners and uh, and and provide as much support with um, navigating those those issues awesome, instead of um, instead of you know sort of going down the breach line. That's just uh, that's just not where we want to be. A key yeah. part of my job as well, I guess, is to when, so I do quality assurance review of any new section 69 agreement and make sure that I feel comfortable and and I can sort of manage those threats. And if they can't sort of, yeah, we'll have that upfront discussion before even we even enter agreement, which is sort of a key, key step to avoid those circumstances in the first place. Fantastic. Thank you both for that. Um, Helen, a quick question for you. We've had a few questions about um, sort of joining um, HSI, if you've already got other covenants on land, um, do they just still apply to you through that process the same way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you can be a part of any uh, covenanting organisation or um, any offsetting organisation. Uh, as long as you're managing your land for wildlife, um, we're more than happy to welcome you on board. So, yeah, it doesn't change our agreements at all. Fantastic. And in similar vein, Andrew had a question if you've already got a trust for nature, can you apply for an offset as well, or is that a bit more difficult? Uh, no, we don't want to, I guess there's a question around, I guess, additionality, because um, in some veins you would say, well, hang on, the site's already protected, so what's the additionality for your offset agreement? But we don't want to penalise landowners who in the past have entered a voluntary trust for nature covenant. Um, and so we, yes, we do allow a section 69 offset agreement to apply where there is an existing Trust Match Covenant. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know we've gone a little over time, so I might just ask one more question of Peter and then we'll wrap up. Um, this is one you actually answered in the chat already, but I thought it'd be helpful for others to know, Peter. Um, so someone asked if they could join with their organisation um, or maybe community groups. Is that something that you guys are willing to, to take on and work with? Uh, and I've, I've answered that yes. I haven't actually asked the... Uh, committee but certainly we're looking for you know to grow our membership and grow our influence and you know, spread the knowledge so that was Lou I think asked that and I said yeah let's get in touch um, the website's there I've also put an email in the in the chat so if anyone's wanting to get in touch then there's an email in the chat in the in the Q a um, but yeah get in touch and, and thanks <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and thank you everyone for, for staying a couple of minutes over time as well. Um, yeah, big thank you to all the landholders um, watching them tonight and all the panelists as well for bringing their expertise. It's awesome to see so many people online really excited about conserving their land and fantastic just to see all the groups we've got supporting the one cause. It's great that we can kind of, you know, each group can support each other. And I think it's a fantastic community we're creating here. So. Don't be a stranger, reach out to everyone. We're here to, we're here to help. Um, so any questions, please let us know. But thanks again for joining and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks all. Thank thanks you all. Well Take care. Thanks a lot for that.